while Tashi's getting the uh, slide deck ready, I'll just tell you that um, originally um, I was to be flying to Toronto this afternoon for um, a Canadian Educators Association 125th anniversary meeting and um, celebration with um, people from all across Canada. But because of the announcement last week uh, of me going to the ministry, I need to spend the rest of today and uh, as much time as possible with the person who's taking over for me in Delta. His name is Doug Shepard. So if you know Doug, uh, he's been uh, an assistant superintendent in Delta for six years, and um, we're really, really pleased to have him take over in Delta as the superintendent. And then some of you know Brad, Brad Bowman, and he's going to be taking over as assistant superintendent in Delta, and we will be having a posting sometime in the future, in the near future, for the director of special programs, which is what Brad has been doing in Delta for the last couple of years. So filling in all of those gaps, you'll think, we're, you're, you're glad, and I'm glad that we're not leaving anybody in the lurch in Delta, especially our favorite people. Uh, so we don't want them to figure out that we've uh, abandoned them or anything like that, because we ha I have not. So, <laughs> um, so good morning. Um, I, I have the distinct honor of working with Tashi Krinsik on a regular basis, because um, in our district we have a, a collaborative uh, working group with all kinds of educators across the district who come together. So it would be the coordinators and the principals, vice principals, directors, and so on. We try very hard to have a very flattened organization. Flat organization without hierarchy means we get to meet together. And I get, again, the privilege of learning from Tashi on a regular basis. So um, I have been part of the mentorship um, advisory uh, council for a little while now. Was it four years? years, wow, a little while. Um, and that way I have been connected to mentorship, which is something that's always been part of my heart in, in education. As a beginning educator, I last year I mentioned to many of you, I had the privilege of having a couple of fabulous mentors. One was a more curricular mentor, the other was probably a mentor who um, showed me the ropes, said do not go and sit in that chair in the staff room. And he said things like that to me, which made me a lot wiser inside the school initially, but eventually I did sit in that chair in the staff room, a little bit of a rabble rouser, <laughs> a little time bit, um, and said, well, if we're going to get together as a staff, I wanted to be in the middle of that. I didn't want to be on the outside. I didn't want to be on the skirt. I didn't want to be in the back room. I wanted to be in the middle of it all. So that's how I established myself in the beginning of my career. And I was so fortunate to have those people um, helping me along the way. So that's how I understood mentorship from the very beginning of my career. And then every time I have moved uh, along in my career to another role, another responsibility, I have found a mentor. I have found somebody or some people to tap into their knowledge and their wisdom. And eventually, the blessings I've had have created this network of people around me who are fabulous. I can pick up the phone, I can email, and sometimes they're actually on my speed dial on my phone, and I can call them or text them and say, help, I, I, I don't know this answer, I need to know where to go with this, and they help me. So that's part of, um, I think, eventual, uh, you know, connections to mentorship is that network, establishing a fabulous network of people around you. So mentorship is a part of all of that professional learning that I have done in my career, and, and today we'll explain to you uh, what the, what's happened in Delta as a result of a new uh, mentorship program that has been around for three years now, okay, three, three and a half years. So our, the title is not accidental, Inquiry and Mentorship, Cultural Transformation. Um, we started down our journey um, uh, a few years ago now, in, actually in 2011, with a vision process, and so what I could say, and I'll, I'll go through very quickly on the slides, and I know that Tashi will fill in a lot of the details and, and the really great learning that's happened along the way. Um, but I'll just tell you about the elements of transformation. The, if, if a culture is going to change, it takes a lot of effort from a lot of people, and it takes um, some structure. You know, it's not all about structure, but if you don't have some structures in place, the culture isn't going to feel like it's embedded in the community the school district community or the school community. So we started with a vision, and the vision is shared by uh, everyone, and it was a big uh, job to get that done, but it was very instrumental in getting us started. We also realized that we needed to develop inquiry-mindedness. We needed a collaborative inquiry and professional learning culture. 
And we also knew that we needed some district-wide initiatives that would bring people together and, and share that culture and share that learning in many different ways, and I'll share some of those with you. And then finally, we realized that it, if we were sharing our learning, it was going to make a lot more sense over time for us to learn from one another. And that means learning both the mistakes and the successes, right? The challenges and the opportunities. All of those things we were learning together. So when we developed this vision, it was done in every school in the district, and it was done also as a big parcel, a big package as a district community. And so here we are in a big gymnasium. I think there was 10 people from every school. We have 31 schools in the district, so you can imagine that room is pretty packed with people. Um, but it also meant that we brought together teachers, parents, administrators, students, um, support staff, um, senior staff, and trustees in the same room. And we created this vision for the future in Delta. And there it is. And it's really hard to see from where you are. You can go onto the Delta website and see it, but really those three themes um, that circle around the sunshine there are, are really important ones. And one of them talks about teachers. And the teacher, the work that teachers do and the professional learning that teachers do is really instrumental to making all of that student engagement happen. So off we went and we said, how are we going to achieve that vision? We're going to achieve that vision through inquiry, creating inquiry-mindedness. And we looked at a couple of researchers. The one that we started with was Helen Timperley, and Helen Timperley is a New Zealand professor out of Auckland University, and she's actually come to Delta, and she presented this year. Uh, if you ever get a chance to hear her, I highly recommend it. She is brilliant. But what she says in her book here, Realizing the Power of Professional Learning, is very profound, and it told us that if we were going to create a culture, if we wanted to create a culture where professional learning was really at the heart of all of our work, we needed to create opportunities for people to engage in inquiry. And so we started down this pathway and we um, were working with Helen Timperley's book. Now Helen Timperley is, is very connected with Judy uh, Halbert and Linda Kaiser in, Delta, er, er, in British Columbia. And so when they were working with Helen together, they wrote this book, Spirals of Inquiry for Equity and, Qu in, and Quality. Should be equality, equity and quality, that's right. Um, but when you talk to Judy and Linda, they will talk um, very much about how Helen Temperley influenced their work. And so they give great credit to Helen. So Helen's uh, research, she's an incredible researcher, um, led to this other book. And you got it there? There you go. <laughs> We're advertising. You can buy this. It's, it's, uh, it, it gives money back into the BC Principals and Vice Principals Association. And so if you would like to buy that book, it's absolutely fabulous. And I know UBC student teachers use it. They all do. And uh, I actually brought that, that organization I was supposed to go to, fly to this afternoon. I brought, I think it was 100 of those books back there to a conference back in, in uh, the fall, as well as another organization that I'm part of. I just bring the books with me because I'm so impressed with the work that's gone on to create the book. But also, we use this Spirals of Inquiry all of the time in our work in Delta. So what this has led to is, again, here's another piece of that, um, the, one of the elements that's really led to the cultural shift in Delta. The whole professional learning community across Delta comes together regularly. We've built in collaborative time into all of our schools, which means inside the school, they are exploring inquiry questions together. They are exploring their, their own work together. They are deepening their practice. They're deepening their learning about uh, education. And so that happens regularly. And out of all of these opportunities came some real distinct um, initiatives for us to follow up on as a district. So we didn't start the district-wide initiatives until we heard from the field. And the field said, these are the things you need to focus on more deeply across the system. And so we started down that, path, that pathway. The one was um, really creating a deeper and more profound way to do inquiry. So we have a coordinator of inquiry in every one of our schools, just a piece of time, a little bit of time, for people to connect um, the questions in the school and connect with one another. Those people get together, um, I think it's about once every month or six weeks or something like that, six weeks, and they, um, they learn together professionally, and then they go back to their school, and they might bring it forward at a professional day or at a, a staff meeting. And the staff meetings in schools have shifted. The staff meetings in schools have become professional learning 
topic um, opportunities. Rather than being um, all kinds of administration, they have changed the culture inside the schools by every opportunity they get, both through the collaborative time every couple of weeks and the, and the uh, staff meetings and professional days, the teachers are sharing their inquiries together. So we have a district principal of innovation and inquiry in the school district. It was Neil Stevenson, it's now Brooke Moore. Um, sorry, Westman. <laughs> but she came to work in Delta this past year and it's been uh, exceptional for, for all of us. Um, so that was one thing we did, we focused on inquiry. Then, through the inquiry processes across the field, people were saying the things that we needed to focus on together, one of them was assessment. That our assessment practices, we really needed to deepen our understanding and learn together, so it wasn't going to be teacher by teacher or school by school, it was going to be also district-wide. And so we started this district-wide initiative, we have somebody who is in charge of that, uh, uh, principal, uh, district Principal of Curriculum Instruction and Assessment, that's been Diane Graves, she's actually going off to Maple Ridge. They've just hired her, away from us, sadly. Um, <laughs> sadly and madly. <laughs> yeah. But this whole idea about assessment really needed a coordinated person, a person to coordinate this, bring us together, be the, the deep learner about this, and she is incredible. So we actually have somebody else who's being hired to do that now, so that's gonna be a great addition to the staff as well. The other district-wide initiative that came out of our inquiry is absolutely changing our practice in Delta, and it's changing the culture in Delta. The conversations we're having about Aboriginal learning are profound, and it is going to be life-changing for all of our kids. So this, is, this has been a very, very big initiative. Um, a, lot, a lot of time um, has gone into how to do it well. We, we talked about it's not just for our Aboriginal learners, it's for all of our learners. We are going to change the culture inside of our schools to really engage our kids through um, that Aboriginal curriculum being embedded into everything we do and conversations. And so that is a huge shift in Delta. Not that we weren't acknowledging Aboriginal learning before, but this has been a bigger change and it's been a, a, a very big contributor to the cultural shift. And then, of course, people said, and what about mentorship? And so, and the what about mentorship piece comes in very importantly. We, once upon a time, had a, a mentorship uh, program in Delta, and during budget cuts over the years, the mentorship program disappeared. Um, when I met with the teachers union reps um, and the professional development reps from across the district, um, and asked them if we had a little bit of money, what, what should we put back in? Immediate response, mentorship. It was missing and, and there were a few years in there where the teachers were just left on their own inside of school and that was fine because we had some fabulous people connecting with them, but it wasn't formal, it wasn't organized, and it wasn't necessarily great practice. So uh, we had this opportunity at that point to say, well then we need to hire a coordinator who is going to bring mentorship <laughs> together, this lady here. Um, and <clears throat> we, we said, well, let's develop the model that's a good fit. Because, you know, maybe the other model that we had before wasn't necessarily the best fit for Delta right now. So the reason I'm showing you all those bits and pieces of the district-wide focus is because you can start to see a bit of a building block or a puzzle is, is uh, puzzle piece, as uh, Tashi's going to explain to you in a, in a minute here, is that every single piece that we have introduced has been a contributor to a district-wide cultural transformation. Um, I would say right now, if we tried to take out any one of those things, they might, so there would be a lot of people out there taking us out, <laughs> put it that way, because there's just too much invested in this now. Uh, the mentorship has become a very integral part of the work that we do. It is a very important part of the professional learning package. There's no, there's no way that we would do our entire professional learning practice in Delta for our teachers and, and the offerings we give without having mentorship in place. And you can take that to the bank if the budget system <laughs> process ever, yeah, okay, take, that, take that quote. Uh, so the, the final part I think that just sort of to share with you, and I think this is something we're doing today, and you're doing today, and you're doing it here in this Summer Institute, is you're sharing. And the sharing is vital to changing the culture. It, mistakes, we don't want to repeat them, but we're going to learn from them, and we're going to do that together. 
the um, opportunities, the exciting practice, the best things that are happening, also sharing that, um, and then learning from one another. And the important thing about sharing is, it doesn't mean you have to absolutely copy one another. You have to, it, the, the opportunity here is to learn from one another, not necessarily copy from one another. And so we have this opportunity in Delta regularly to share our learning across the classrooms and schools. And um, we, have, we bring people together once a year for the sharing um, in a formal way, but on a regular basis, um, I would say but monthly, in staff meetings especially, lots of sharing. And then sharing between schools. Our um, collaborative time in secondary schools, for example, is set on exactly the same day at the same time, so that if schools want to share with one another, they can visit one another during that time. And this is just a little bit more sharing that's going on. So where do we share? We share everywhere. <laughs> where we can, we share the story, but we also want to learn from one another. So when we go and visit UVic or uh, NOII or wherever we're going, we're bringing back stories. So we bring a team of people, we, do sh we share what we're learning, and we, we also bring back as many stories as we can. So uh, this is a quote from um, Ken Kay from P21 in the United States. I don't know if you're familiar with who he is, but he's, he's, a, good, he's a great guy to follow um, on Twitter because I think he, he really connects to some of the really good research out there around uh, transformational uh, learning. And so what he says here is that if you want, really want to make a substantive change uh, or a transformation to your culture in your schools or school district, it's going to take time. And eventually it needs to become embedded in the DNA of the community and the leadership and the parents and the students. So what that means is getting that really embedded deeply into your system requires a lot of effort and of time. And uh, he says, how is this culture developed? Well, he says you have to have a lot of trust and really high levels of communication for everyone involved. And um, it can begin from a singular, well-developed, broadly supported vision that expands to all areas to create a learning organization. And I think that's, that's the whole idea of the culture of a learning organization is what that previous graphic that we were shown um, by the PMRT uh, really demonstrates. And uh, a real emphasis on professional learning is what he says here. And how do we know culture is embedded? Well. I put the red part in because um, in the rest of the document, so this is a quote from the document, but somewhere else in the document he says, it's how new teachers are welcomed into the profession. So that's when you're gonna know that your culture is fully embedded, everything's embedded into that culture, it transcends everything else that's shortly of like a, a charismatic leader or um, a dedicated teacher who retires, or we hear this all the time, somebody leaves, the program leaves. Well, if it's embedded in the DNA, if it's really part of what you do in the culture of your district, it doesn't leave when the person leaves, right? So I know that when I leave Delta, this is not leaving um, because it's embedded in the DNA of the district. Over to you. Um, Diane, thank you for setting this up so nicely. So I'm going to focus on uh, the piece of the puzzle that's mentorship. And I think Diane's given us a really great sense of the big picture in Delta. And uh, when we talk about mentorship in Delta, we really are talking about this whole puzzle. And, and I'm gonna just sort of explain how we fit mentorship into that puzzle and align with the other things that are going on in the district. So um, just to uh, give you a little bit of grounding, the aims of the Delta Mentorship Program are to increase learner success through innovative teaching. That comes directly from our vision. Uh, to foster a culture of collaboration and professional learning both within schools and across the district. That also comes directly from our vision. Uh, to positively impact the efficacy and teaching of both protégés and mentors. Um, I'm sure like everyone in here, we really value the reciprocal learning relationship. And in particular in Delta, we're very concerned about building the capacity of the mentors. Because they, our mentors are people who are in uh, already have spheres of influence. They're pro-D chairs, they're um, staff committee leaders, they're department heads. So um, we see mentorship as an opportunity to build their skills and that will ripple out into other areas of the district. And we've seen some evidence of that this year. We had our largest turnover of mentors. We had um, seven mentors leave the program this year after several years of participation. Um, and most of them were leaving because they wanted to focus on other leadership opportunities. And that doesn't just mean becoming an administrator, it's like 
being an IB coordinator at one of our IB schools or taking on the role of uh, coordinator of inquiry. So we are seeing some evidence of that. And then um, the last one is you know, really, really basic and simple. We want to increase retention of skilled teachers in Delta. And um, one of the things I think we don't talk about in mentorship, and I'd just like to kind of throw it out there, is we talk about retention of teachers. Um, in Delta, we're concerned about keeping skilled teachers and helping teachers to be skilled. We're not that interested in keeping unskilled teachers in the district because we're striving for excellence. So we either want to help teachers become skilled or we want to mentor them out of the profession. And there is a huge piece of mentorship that has to do with you know, helping people realize that maybe this isn't the right fit for them. And we don't like to talk about it because it's not very nice, but that's something that, that is part of my work in Delta. I have, I have difficult conversations like that sometimes. Um, Diane already used this image. This is an image um, that we come back to over and over in Delta. Um, and one of the reasons that we come back to it over and over is because it's, um, it represents um, some of the, the core values of the program, and that's that it's evolving and responsive. So when I look at this, you know, I, I immediately think of like a salmon swimming and sort of that you know, m movement and the uh, changing the way you, the direction. And, but at the same time, all of these salmon in this image are headed in the same direction, right? They're all headed towards the center. And in, in Delta, we have that kind of alignment, and I strive to align mentorship with the things that, that Diane was talking about. So this is a really rich image for us. You can also see it in terms of like stakeholders, you know, talking about the different stakeholders or different elements of a mentorship program. There's, it's, a, it's Susan Point's image, and it's just a beautiful metaphor, I think, for mentorship. Um, so this is one of our mentoring teams in Delta, and this was early this year. Um, so we have a cohort-based model, a team-based approach. Um, so we have two to three mentors and um, then a group of protégés. We, we group them based on geography because Delta is spread out over three distinct communities, Tuas and Ladner and North Delta. So we really take geography into account, uh, subject area, grade level, and interest. So we try and gather as much information from, and we use the term protege in Delta, we gather as much information about the protégés as possible and, and then make those groupings. So one thing I want to point out here is that you can't tell in this picture who the mentors are and who the protégés are. They, they're just a group of teachers collaborating together. And um, in this image, we have some teachers who are in their first year in the program. We have some teachers who are in their second year in our program. And there's even a teacher in there who decided to stay for a third year, just wanting some more support. So um, our team-based approach allows us to be uh, responsive. Um, the next thing I want to point out is that a mentorship program needs to evolve. When I first took on mentorship in Delta, I thought, okay, we've got this shiny new program. It was really informed by the work that was happening in Richmond. And it was like, okay, it's perfect. Now we just implement it. And it was really hard for me, and it was big learning for me to realize that every year the program was going to evolve, that I was going to try things that weren't going to work, and I would have to adjust them. And that I would try things that I didn't think were going to be great, and we would carry them on. So some of what I'm going to talk about is this evolution, and we don't really know where we're going. The program is, is still changing, and uh, especially this year, going into next year, we have some, some pretty significant changes. So... Um, just to look back into the past, um, some of the changes that we've already made to be responsive to what's going on in the district and to the needs of the teachers we're trying to support. So in our first year, we didn't have an inquiry focus. And sort of partway through the year, myself and some colleagues went, hmm, inquiry is a really big deal in Delta. We should probably have an inquiry focus. So the mentors work with uh, this inquiry question, how can we best support our peers so they embrace and model wise practice. This is a great question because it en encompasses both parts of mentorship. The how, the mentoring skills, like Nancy was speaking about, the coaching, the collaborating, the connecting. It also encompasses what is wise practice. And so in Delta, we turn to our vision for wise practice. So we talk about innovative teaching and we define that within Delta's context. What does wise teaching practice look like in Delta? Um, the next change that we made uh, came uh, during that same year and we introduced a lesson study model. So we have a, 
little pot of money separate from our release time to release um, smaller teams of teachers to engage in a lesson study process. So they co-plan a lesson, somebody teaches it, everyone else observes it, focusing on the learning of the students, and then they um, take some time to debrief it. And uh, this came out of just b basically a request from the mentors and protégés that they could get into each other's classrooms and actually do some teaching together. So we heard that loud and clear. We weren't comfortable spending a lot of money on just releasing teachers to go observe each other. Um, we had done some reading and found that that maybe doesn't actually have a huge impact on practice, just going to watch somebody else do what they do. So we decided to adopt the lesson study. The first year we had one team participate in lesson study. Uh, the second year we had three teams participate, and this year I think we've had four teams. So teams are starting to pick it up. One thing that's really great about lesson study is um, we will also release teachers who are not involved in mentorship. So for example, we had a, a group that focused on math. They brought in our wonderful math coordinator, Jacob Martins, to be a part of that process. Teams will bring in um, a principal or a vice principal or another coordinator or another teacher to be a part of that process. So that also helps to sort of broaden the impact of mentorship. Uh, the final change we made was how we um, create the mentorship teams. And these are pictures from, from this year. So the names on the red pieces of paper are mentors, and the names on the blue and purple are uh, protégés. In the past, the first year, I made the teams, and it was horrible. It was such a horrible experience. Um, and like I just, I, I, I couldn't get it right. I didn't have enough information. I didn't have enough brain power to figure out how to fit these teachers together. You know, I think I'd get it and then I'd share it with a colleague and she'd go, oh, but what about this? And so I go back and I just wasted so much time. So the next year, um, we grouped the mentors together and then as a group, we did this card sorting process and it worked really, really well. And then we took it one step further, thinking about uh, backward design and the needs of the protégés, and we grouped the protégés together first, and then we picked the mentors who would best meet the needs of those protégés. So rather than saying to the mentors, who do you want to work with, we looked at which mentors could best meet the needs of the protégés. So, I mean, it's something really simple, but our teams were far more successful this year than they have been in the past. Um, so this is where we're at now. Um, I've been engaged in an, a, a really deep inquiry process this year using uh, Judy and Linda's spiral. And my question is, how can we deepen and broaden the impact of mentorship? So, um, you know, thinking about going deeper, it's about those roots. We want it to, you know, if funding gets cut and my position is gone and, and you know, I move on and whatever happens, it needs to be rooted enough in Delta that the mentorship will happen in some form if, you know, if catastrophic things happen. Uh, we also want it to be more firmly grounded in teaching practice and what's best for students. So um, the other piece is broadening it. We're not impacting enough teachers. There are lots of early career teachers in Delta who do not participate in the mentorship program. There are lots who say, I don't have time. There are lots of teachers who aren't early career teachers who really could use some mentorship and who choose not to participate. Uh, there are administrators in the district who really don't know what's going on with mentorship. Um, and there are teachers who really don't know. It's changing. Every year our numbers increase. This year I had 20 applications to fill six mentorship positions. So that was, that was huge. I had to say no to some really qualified candidates. And uh, so we're making impact, but we're not doing enough. And the image that uh, Allison and Nancy used yesterday was, I wish I had just had it, it was so, it's so perfect. So, um, you know, we're broadening and we're deepening and, and connecting. So this is uh, what I'm looking at going forward. So um, I have, I'm, what I'm gonna do now is just talk about some of the actions that we're gonna take next year, some of the things we're gonna try out. And, um, there are other ones, but I'm just going to give you one example for, for each. So um, we want to deepen the impact of mentoring by grounding it in teaching. And this comes directly from Helen Timberley's work at the NOII. I was sitting there listening to her thinking about these things, and I thought, huh, we can do that in mentorship. That sounds good. Um, and uh, so what we're going to try and do early in the year is we're going to have protégés do a, a brief scan of 
their students? What's, what are the students in, in front of them like this year? And set a learning goal, a specific learning goal um, for that class. Like, what do I need to work on in my teaching to best meet the needs of these students? And I, we, I, not what am I interested in and what do I feel like learning about, but how can I best meet the needs of these students? What can I change? Um, and the mentors will be facilitating that and we'll do some work on that before they meet with their protégés. Then the mentors as a team are gonna sit down and look at those learning goals of the protégés and they're going to decide what their learning goals as a collective need to be. So that might be everyone, you know, say every protégé is looking at assessment, then the mentors can be looking at assessment. Maybe there will be a diverse um, group of goals and so the mentors are gonna to have to make some tough decisions. Who's gonna learn about assessment? Who's gonna learn about technology integration? What, whatever it's going to be. So they're gonna set their learning goals based on the needs of the protégés and then I'm gonna look at the needs of the mentors and I'm gonna set my learning goal in the direction for our mentor learning sessions which happen uh, five times throughout the year. I'm gonna set my learning goals in that direction uh, based on the needs of the mentors. And through this nesting process, I'm really hoping that we will be able to directly connect leader and mentor learning and protege learning to student learning, which is our goal. I mean, in our vision, it says, Delta is going to be a leading district in innovative teaching practice and learner success. So just trying to align mentorship with that a little bit more. Um, so broadening the impact by being more inclusive. Um, we've had a pretty big do not enter sign to our administrators. Uh, when mentorship first started, I went to a principal's meeting and um, Nancy Gordon, one of our assistant superintendents, um, at the time was our director and, and you know my superior. And, I started to get questions from the principals like, well, we want veto power over who can be mentors and we want to um, be able to refer teachers to mentorship. And I didn't have to fight those battles because Nancy and, and Diane and the other um, senior leaders really believed in the sanctity and power of a teacher-to-teacher -teacher mentoring relationship. And Nancy just stood up and said, no, like, <laughs> hands off. And, uh, and, you know, that was really great. We needed that, we needed that protection. But um, I started to get some feedback from some of the administrators, one of whom is my husband, um, <laughs> about the fact that there was, there was a sense and there was starting to be, it wasn't just him, people were starting, other administrators were starting to approach him and like, like, hey, how come there's no space for us to be involved in mentorship? They're asking us to be educational leaders in our schools and then they're saying, you're not a mentor. We actually had one example where a principal gave one set of advice, and a mentor gave a different set of advice, and that put the protege in a really bad, bad situation. Uh, so we, we wanted to open that door up and find some space for administrators, especially school-based administrators, to participate in mentorship. Um, and so what we're, going, what we're going to try this year, there's a, there's a few things, but I think the the most interesting one came out of an interview I did with some uh, principals, and I was interviewing Aaron Akune, one of our secondary principals, and he said, what if you hosted some kind of meeting like where I could talk to the teachers who are new to my building? And so we collaborated on that a little bit and, and came up with the idea, and in my head I call it cluster meetings, which it's just, it's just how I'm framing it in my head. If you have a better title for me after you hear the description, <laughs> I would love to hear it. Um, and, and what I'm hoping to do is have, um, take all of our secondary schools and all of the feeder schools, feeder elementary schools, and um, invite the administrators in those buildings and anyone new to the building to a meeting that's hosted by mentorship. And uh, you know, if we have some mentors that are attached to those buildings, we'll ask them to come as well. And it will, it will be a meeting where we flatten things, like Diane talked about. So I will be holding the meeting, hosting the meeting, and it will be an opportunity to open up learning conversations between administrators and new teachers. Uh, we'll, you know, Aaron suggested questions like he would love to share his stories of being a new teacher with the new teachers in his building. He wanted to have an opportunity to ask the, the new teachers in his building what they wanted from him. So you know, I think I'll have a, a, a difficult 
job of making sure it doesn't become principals talking at the new teachers because we often put them in that position and that's what we ask them to do. Uh, but hopefully we'll be able to facilitate it in a way so that we have created some space to start those learning conversations. And my hunch is, is that that will open it up for the whole year, that that teacher will be more likely to go and ask their principal for advice, to invite their principal into their classroom, you know, to, to ask them to come do some team teaching with them. So that's one of the ways that we are trying to broaden the impact uh, by being more inclusive. Um, so I just want to end with this quote, and this comes from Brenda. Where's Brenda? So Brenda gave me this quote a few months ago, and it has really shaped my thinking. And I actually have written an entire paper for a course I'm taking um, around this quote. So um, thank you, Brenda. Um, a seed holds an incredible life force. When conditions are right, the seed bursts, sending forth an embryo root and stem. Each time, the same thing happens with mind-boggling regularity. But the key to the process is to give the right seed the right conditions, which is the gardener's job. And so I challenge you to think of yourselves um, as the gardener. So what can you do for each seed that's within your sphere of influence, whether that's an individual teacher, whether that's a program, whether that's a whole system? And I think we can use this metaphor to understand all of it. I also challenge you to see yourself as the seed, right? So wh what's your learning and, and what's your grow growth area? And, and, and how are you going to root yourself and, and, and uh, stretch up and out as well? So um, that's just a little bit about how we do things in Delta. And uh, I think, is there time for questions or no? Okay, so maybe Diane, if you wanna come back. I don't know if there's any questions, but, oh, Mary. No, we spend most of our budget on training our mentors. So uh, we'll have a full day in September and then four half days throughout the year. We call them mentor learning sessions. We've moved, to, that's another change. We moved away from the word training after the first year. Um, so those sessions focus on uh, mentoring skills. We use Mentoring Matters, Lipton and Wellman as, as one of our books. We use group, groups at work. And they also focus on wise teaching practice. So. Last year we did a whole session on assessment because I surveyed the mentors and asked what they thought their learning focus should be and like 90% of them said assessment. So we spent a morning talking about assessment. So we spend way more money on our mentors than we do on our protégés. Uh, you said you had to limit the amount of mentors. Why? Funding. TTOC costs. Yeah. So, um, I had a budget this year of $70,000, which was mainly release time. To So we released the mentors for the learning sessions, and then we also released all the mentors and protégés four times a year for a half-day team meeting that the mentors facilitate. So we spend a lot of money on, on release time, and we just can't we can't release everybody. And, and we believe that we, we don't want to send people out into the field mentoring if they don't have a solid skill base. So, um, yeah, so we go quality over quantity. And you also uh, do a bit of like outside of class time and inside of? Um, so we ask, um, the, the bulk of mentoring happens in these formal meetings that, um, that are half days. Uh, and then we say that mentors are available, you know, as needed to the protégés throughout the year. And different protégés access, access that different amounts. Like, Heather's one of our mentors in the back there, and she works a ton with teachers outside of school hours. She's super engaged and, you know, always looking to learn. And um, we encourage our mentors to do things like invite protégés to come with them to professional learning and, you know, invite them to sit on committees. Um, but we don't have, like, a formal requirement for that. One of the things that senior management's been looking at, and you don't know this yet, so just plug your ears, um, is as time goes by, if there are more new teachers than there currently are in Delta, so you know, that's that's going to be a given. We Wasn't it Charlie Naylor supplied us with some stats last year, and we 
thought, oh boy, <laughs> what's coming at us? So we've talked about increasing the budget of, for release time, um, if that happens and when that happens. So we need to be responsive to it. So if we all of a sudden were hiring a lot of new teachers, more than we had in the past, we would need to up the dollars for the mentorship training or the mentor training because we'd need more mentors. So we're going to keep an eye on that over time and, um, and put some dollars aside to encourage that to, to happen if the need arises. So, really good question because you're right. Not every system has uh, an opportunity to hold district-wide vision process. Schools can do a vision process internally, and there's some lots of ways for us to share how that could happen inside a school. But I would say, if you take a look at professional learning as a topic, right? So in a district, what does your professional learning need to look like district-wide? What do you need to offer? And I think we do do some strategic planning in most districts around that, but what's it based on? So I think you would have to start with a survey. So what is the real need out there in terms of professional learning? Because you don't want to offer things that are not of value because it costs dollars and, it, and if it's not of interest, then you, you may have hired somebody who's not needed, not that you're not. But, you know, so I think you definitely would need to focus in on what the needs are in the, in the district. So when we, when we did something like that through our inquiry process, right? So inquiry you could introduce quite readily across the district and lots of pockets and places in the schools. Um, and out of those inquiries, if you were to gather that data, what are people inquiring about? What are they asking about? If you were to gab, grab all of that data and say, all right, they're looking at assessments. Significantly across the sector, we're looking at assessment. So if that's the case, then you would want to offer some assessment practices. But if you also said, well, we're not offering enough mentorship to our new teachers, there's another opportunity for you to take that topic and go with it in terms of professional learning. So I agree with you, Nancy, absolutely. Not every system can have that perfect alignment with the vision. But you can start with a need. So if it's a needs analysis kind of process through inquiry, that might be a good way to start. It would be holistic, and I would say that you, you need the ear of senior management because they're the budget decision makers, right? So you and, you, and your board. So um, not all trustees understand all comprehensively all of these things, but they will turn to senior management and say, so give us the advice. So senior management really needs to be invested in this and, and really um, the champions of it, really, because if they're not, then they're not going to give the dollars to it, and I'm sorry to say it should not come down to dollars and cents, but it does. If you're going to get the release time for this to happen, it needs to be because somebody really believes in it, and then I love the way Trashy does this. She sends out these brilliant invitations to us to come and join the, the mentors at the beginning and mentees at the beginning of the year, and, um, and also celebrations at the end of the year, and drags a few people in during the, uh, the sessions to say, come and see what's going on. So she keeps us engaged with the work, and she keeps us focused on the work. So that's an important part of, of Tashi's role, is to make sure we know what's going on. I mean, the excitement, where's that graphic? It's back, oh, it was on the slide at the back, sorry. Um, you know, taking a look at the lesson study, for example. How exciting is that? Uh, that's coming out of a really great body of work that she's doing, and and if we didn't know that, we couldn't, we couldn't champion it. We couldn't be behind it. We couldn't say, and if there are more new teachers, we need more money. So 
Great question. Thanks. You're, you're right. Absolutely. It has to start somewhere, and it has to start from the deep passion that all of you have and, and for this work. They're just not opting in. So, <clears throat> what's been your response in terms of modification? So there's, there's a whole bunch of little things. I think part of it is um, what Diane's talking about, about telling the stories. So if you don't control the story and tell the story of mentorship, someone else will. So I make sure that I'm out in front of that and I'm telling the story. So um, we have had increase every year. Um, one... Um, one really great example is I, we had a teacher who did two years in mentorship and then she was out this year, you know, doing her thing and now she's moving from a learning support position from French to English and she's going into a kindergarten class at a new school. And I had got this desperate email from her in the middle of June saying, can I please come back to mentorship? And I was like, Abs obviously yes, but, but there's an example of where I'm not doing a good job of telling that story because she didn't know that she, she thought she was going to have to beg to get back into the program. And so um, there's a few things. One thing I'm looking at doing this year is we have, pay, and I'm sure everyone does, like when you switch schools or switch roles, there's paperwork that you have to fill out. I think it's just for the TOC list, right? So they know like what to put your preferences on like when you need a TOC. Um, and I just want to get a line at the bottom that says like, you know, are you new to the district? Are you new to a school? Are you new to a role? If so, you're eligible to participate in mentorship. Contact Tashi Krinzik at. And I think that will make a big difference. Uh, this year was the first year that I was able to be at the new teacher orientation, um, which is mainly TOCs. So I did like a quick five minute presentation there. And we started a TTOC cohort this year, um, which was, you know, we had between 10 and 20 TTOCs attend on a regular basis. Um, but it was there and it was being offered. I imagine next year we're gonna have more. I think the key is just awareness and um, getting the word out and then showing that it's valuable. So that's where also sharing the stories. Like you need teachers to say, wow, I did mentorship and it was amazing. It totally made things so much better because teachers feel overwhelmed and they'll, they often say to me, I just don't have time. We also have a blog. Uh, in our district called 180daysoflearning.com and and some of the stories that come through there so I highly recommend if you've got a district website blog place that you could really tell some stories about what mentoring does for the teachers the new teachers and what it does for the mentors as well so really telling those stories and I, you know don't beat yourself up too much you've done a great job of telling the stories but people aren't necessarily reading them or hearing them. So it's how to get to that audience. Well, I think the blog is a good way to do it, but also um, it's something that senior management can take on as a responsibility to make sure it gets told at principals' meetings and then the principals can take it back and tell it at their staff meetings and, uh, and so on. So there's, there's a lot more people who could be participating and helping in this if we get this right. I'm just so thrilled we had this time with you. Uh, it's, it's just really grounded so much of what we spoke about yesterday, but to actually see how culture gets grounded and worked through responsibly in a district, it's just such an, a valuable thing. And knowing that for each of us it won't look the same, but there is so much we can learn from the journey that you have you've, you've presented to us. So thank you so much. Uh, there's so much to dig into with this. I just want to make sure that you each have a little token of thanks because you're such wonderful people. And I can't tell you how happy we are that Diane is going to be in the Ministry of Education. <laughs> 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 And of course, Tashi being on our, our resource team too. So the, the network continues to grow and strengthen. So thank you both so much.